why would you ever have a fixed full-time team for a business that has variable needs? Every business has variable needs. And those variable needs get impressed upon accounting the same way they do other functions. Why not have a flex resource to help even if you have full-time people? Welcome to In the Thick of It Toolbox, the special series where inspiration meets implementation. Here, we don't just share success stories, we equip you with proven tools and strategies from seasoned founders, turning entrepreneurial dreams into actionable plans. Prepare to be enabled and empowered on your journey. You're not just listening to a podcast, you're gaining access to an essential toolbox for your business success. Let's dive in. You're listening to a special episode of the In the Thick of It podcast toolbox series. Today, we're talking outsourced accounting. Running the financial and accounting aspects of a business is complex, time consuming, and frankly, not very fun for most entrepreneurs and business owners. That's why many companies, both small startups and larger established businesses, are turning to outsourced accounting firms to handle this critical but unexciting work. My guest today is Patrick Tam, CEO of Bright Balance Accounting, a fractional accounting and finance firm. Patrick has over 15 years experience in finance across a variety of industries. He'll share when it makes sense to outsource your accounting, what to look for in a firm, and how the right partner can provide strategic advice to help grow your business, not just crunch the numbers. So whether you're already working with an outsourced accounting provider or just considering it, this episode is full of practical tips and advice. Let's dive in. I'm so thrilled to have Patrick Tam with Bright Balance. Patrick, welcome to In the Thick of It. Yeah, thank you. So give us some background. Where'd you go to school? What'd you study? I'm originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to Oklahoma State. I didn't think I'd find myself in accounting initially. My mom was a CPA, so you know I was around it a lot, but I was actually set up to be an art major. Those are I, worlds apart. I don't know if you know right. that. Yeah. You wouldn't think, you know, accountants being creative, but I uh, studied art as a child and really enjoyed it and thought, well, it's an easy progression from school. You know, you go into college, what do you want to be? I was like, you know, let's study art. But I kind of realized as I approached college that you can't really make a living. It would be hard to make a living as an artist. So I... uh fell back on, before I even started, kind of fell back on accounting as, well, it's like the next most logical thing around me. We'll we'll try that. And, you know, pretty much didn't like it. I felt like it was difficult. I know you, in your comments, will talk about how, you know, accounting was your favorite thing to have gotten past. I wouldn't say I'm that far away from that sentiment, at least in the academic setting, but I made it through. I didn't change my major or anything like that. And it wasn't until I graduated and got in the real world, had a real job, that I realized it's totally different than in school. Yeah. Talking about art, I mean, art's such a broad field. What aspects of art were you into? Was it painting? Was it sculpture? Was it sketching? Was it? I did everything. I mean, from a young age, my grandmother was really into art. And so that was something we did as a family. It's kind of one of those things, if you have a child that is talented in something or you you recognize they're interested in something, you might just lean into it. And so I think that was what my parents did. Every I'd have art camp or something like that they sent me to. And so as they kind of promoted that, it made it a, a natural progression maybe to study in school and think about a career. However, I didn't see that many professional careers that might lead to a good living at the time. So do you still dabble in the arts? Yeah. Yeah. I still enjoy, um, you know, as a hobby, painting and that kind of thing. What do you like to paint? My style is a little bit abstract. I'm a fan of uh, impressionist art. So it goes everything from somewhat impressionist to complete abstract. Very cool. Yeah. I've known you for a while. Did not know that about you. So you talked about how our experience or enjoyment of accounting in college was probably on par. And, and for people who haven't heard my story, among the top 10 happiest days of my life, coming in at like nine and 10, we'll, we'll start with coming to faith and getting married and, and having my, my three awesome kids. But somewhere in that eight, nine, nine and 10 spot are the days that I completed managerial and financial accounting in college. 
as a marketing major, had to take both of those along with uh, some finance classes. And I made C's in both of those accounting classes. I was not a C student. I could not have been happier to have gotten a C. And my parents were fine with it too, which made it all the better. So yeah, accounting is not a strong suit. And we'll talk more about this as we get further. But I think that that is the case for a lot of business owners. Accounting is not a strong suit for them. And that's why firms like yours exist. Not only am I not good at it, but it's not something I want to take the time to become good at, especially when there are people in the world that live for this kind of thing. So after college, you did what? I graduated from Oklahoma State. My first job was in commercial banking, of all things. I helped implement activity-based costing throughout the bank, which is kind of a dry and obscure thing to do. But the cool thing about it is it allowed me to see every area of the bank's operations. So everything from commercial lending, which you're familiar with how it works, to cash vault operations and wholesale lockbox operations and things where you have nightly processing of items. So it gave me a window into a, a business that had 30, 40 functions to it that I could study and learn from. And so for the first couple of years of my professional career, learned the ins and outs of something that had a fairly complicated operation to it in a way that for me was an easy process of discovery. That was part of the job is, hey, learn what the functions of all, all of these different departments do and figure out how much they cost to operate. So when you talked about activity-based costing, is that what you described it as? Like that literally is how much does each of these components of this process cost the bank? Yep. And then from there, was there an effort to reduce or was it simply to understand? Yeah, the first thing was first to understand, right? And maybe to re reduce, maybe to better price. It's hard to know what is the profitability or the cost inherent in some of your transactional processing, especially because as a bank, you're not charging for everything, right? A bank fundamentally is making money on, on interest, on interest margin. And then it's most of its operations are loss leader as it takes deposits and all that has brick and mortar branches and things that have to, you know, have a operating expense to them. So the whole concept, which is taken from manufacturing, has to do with understanding costs and attributing it to activities that are related to products and customers. Going back to college for a second, your major was accounting or finance? Yep, or it was accounting. Okay. Did you have coursework that was around manufacturing and process and, and that sort of thing? Or is that something just innate and or something that you learned? Yeah, I think it goes back to this a little bit of why accounting for me was not interesting. But yet in school, yet after school was so helpful and interesting, you know, in an academic setting, yes, we learned cost accounting. You know, managerial accounting, you talked about leaving or getting past an element of that is cost accounting. They'll teach you, but it's all academic. It's not applied in a real world way. At least it wasn't where I went to school. So I, that was 20 years ago. So for me, my experience, it was dry and not very interesting. Whereas the real world, you have that opportunity to see complexity in business and there's maybe not one single right answer, or one textbook way of doing something. So I think there's an element of discovery and problem solving that's inherently better in the real world when you practice accounting than when you're studying it. That makes a lot of sense. You were at the bank for a couple of years. And what did you do after the bank? Yeah, so I was in Tulsa. I left, moved to Dallas in 2007 and worked for a string of different industries, different companies, different roles for about 15 years and uh, various private companies, some public companies. Wasn't necessarily like job hopping or moving from thing to thing that much, but every two, three years would either have a promotion or move to a different company. A lot of my time was spent in financial services, specifically insurance, but had others as well. Software startup at one point, commodity trading company as well. So I, you know, I guess benefited in my career by just seeing a lot of different industries and different company sizes and having fairly interesting roles within them. Yeah. Were they all in the finance and accounting office? Yep. I'm guessing you probably weren't doing accounts payable, but 
Were you in kind of a strategic role in those those different companies? Yeah, so most of my career has been in FP&A, which is financial planning and analysis. You know, that's the kind of the part of the accounting and finance function within a company that will look a little bit more to the future, work a little bit more with the operations and the business to understand profitability of things. So I've kind of always positioned myself towards maybe that side of it just because of the desire to add value in a different way than than recording the past. Earlier, when we were talking about kind of the, the artistic, creative nature that you have, I got to believe that the FP&A aspect lends itself to some creativity and asking what if. And, yeah. you know, if we, if we turn this knob here, what's it going to do over here? And thinking through how all these things connect and does that resonate at all? Yeah. The problem solving process can be a fairly creative one. Analyzing optimizing a, a business process or understanding its bottlenecks and constraints. I think thinking outside of a box is helpful in applying ideas in your process involves creative thought. You had a number of these positions internally with different companies. You did that, I think you said, for about 15 years. Talk to me about Bright Balance and what the vision was in starting that. I had worked, like I said, in in several different roles, several different industries, and I kind of reached this point where I realized either I can continue to try and I could be CFO of one organization, I could continue to work the kind of hours I was um, for a single organization, or, which I had kind of realized at that point, has its own, you know, everywhere has its own issues and everywhere has its own hurdles, its own constraints to your your growth. And I found a lot of my own, call it ambition to add value, was sometimes intention or conflict with departmental politics, or you're dealing with things a lot out of your control, like the success of an industry, the success of a business model, the success of a management team. But I love the work. I really loved just being able to understand businesses and help problem solve. So it occurred to me to look into consulting. I was with a software startup at the time, and it allowed me a little bit of flexibility that I used to kind of explore the consulting side. So I started looking around my network. Hey, if you need help, let me take a look. Maybe I can help you on an hourly basis. And and so that's how it started in 2018, 19. I was just me. And then inevitably a client would ask, hey, I, I need help more than what you're giving me. I need a controller. I need an accountant, senior account or something to help with the month in close. So we'd bring in, you know, others into the process. So it was kind of by accident that the firm started because it really started out of my own desire just to help companies, help them with that extra need that wasn't solved already and grew from there. The term that I use to describe what a firm like yours does is outsourced accounting. And maybe that's too general. Do you term it something different? Yeah. I call Bright Balance a fractional accounting and finance firm. That can mean a lot of things. It's something which I didn't really tell you how we became a quote unquote firm, but it was really COVID in 2020. All of a sudden, everyone can work from wherever they want. You don't have to be in the office. Everything's remote. We all remember that time where we're working from our house for a year. Basically, and for us at the time, it allowed us well, all of a sudden to help our clients in California. No one has to travel. I can help on a fractional basis, anyone, no matter where they are. And I think it opened up a lot of doors for business owners to realize I don't need a full time person. I don't need someone to come in the office and I don't need them sitting down the hall from me necessarily. I just need to advance these certain objectives, I need certain outcomes. And so, Bright Balance started in 2020, officially, and we hired from there and grew pretty quickly. A lot of it had to do with COVID. I think that really kind of accelerated things. But going back to your question about who we are and what we do and kind of what's out there, I think the industry as a whole is realizing accounting doesn't need to be an in-house function. It's easier to realize that when you're a startup, when you're looking at, well, I have a bookkeeper who's been helping me, or I have, we see a lot of times, founder-run uh, businesses that started you know, very 
small, maybe the the spouse is the bookkeeper, right? They have an admin or something that's doing their QuickBooks. And so ultimately they will graduate from that, realize maybe I need more than a part-time bookkeeper that may or may not understand the business, may or may not necessarily understand all of accounting or financial reporting. So there's this, call it need out there that's always been there, but I think for the services industries is really able to absorb, right? You don't have to hire full-time anymore. And as that becomes more prevalent and widely known, I think it's a big tailwind to our business. You touched on something that I think is worth drilling a little bit deeper on too. And actually, I'm going to correlate this back to something different that our firm did years ago. We we now have a, an amazing rock star marketing team in house. But years ago, we worked with with an outside agency. I looked at what we could pay them, where they had people that could write copy, they had people that could do graphic design, they had people that could do video production strategy, on and on and on, and. You don't typically, unless you find a unicorn like we have, you don't typically get that full rounded skill set in one hire. And depending on the size of the business, it probably doesn't make sense to go hire three, four, five people to handle all of those different things. When I think about the the offering of, I liked how you described it, a, a fractional accounting and finance organization within the accounting and finance world, much like I described with the marketing You've got your day-to-day bookkeeping, you've got your accounts payable, your accounts receivable, you've got your bank reconciliations, you've got your month and close. But then there's also that analysis, there's that strategic thinking, there's that really understanding, okay, what's going on in the business when I look at this balance sheet or what is the P&L telling me and what are the things that we need to go do different? Much like that outsourced marketing agency provided this full suite for us for less than the cost of of one full-time equivalent, I think you guys really kind of do the same thing. Right. You know, one of the easy cases we come in is is you need a, a variety of people, variety of levels, but you can't afford all of that. And not only are we covering all those bases for less than a full-time person, but it's also more risk mitigated, right? That full-time person at some point, you know, may go on maternity leave or quit or, you know, have an illness or even just simple vacation sometimes creates a little bit of business impact, whereas a firm you know, has that built-in redundancy. You also have, at the same time, an element of best practice. A lot of firms, and ours is no different, will start specializing in, in certain industries or verticals. And so as you, you look at software companies as an example, and you see one after another after another, you kind of realize you know, a lot of them are dealing with the same issues. A lot of them have the same needs. A lot of them depending on where they are in their their growth story, have a lot of the same process that should be implemented, the same call it best practice. And so you also get this call it awareness from a firm that kind of will help guide you and lead things that, you know, a lot of times an, an individual may not have that background or experience. You touched on something that I think is actually important, not just in the context of the accounting and finance aspect of, of the business, but I think about the work that we do. I think about other outside parties we brought in to help us with with different things. I think it's important for any business to have people from the outside looking at things because to the point you just made, when you bring in somebody that is a consultant of sorts, whether it's marketing, whether it's accounting, whether it's strategy, whether it's you know fill in the blank, HR, they are seeing things across a much broader spectrum and they're able to provide perspective that you can't get when all you're doing is looking in the mirror every day. It's way too close. You need outside perspective in multiple areas of your business to help make sure that you're doing things according to best practice and taking advantage of of trends in the industry and so forth. Yep. They call it the tactical benefit of that diverse experience and kind of knowing where to go with different, you think a lot about accounting, where to go with that you know, is part of it. But there's also this element of when it comes to having a network. I mean, if I think about our clients and our client needs, I often tell our people, our team, like we're more than just accountants. And when I say that, what I mean is, well, if you're looking at getting bank financing or or need refinancing on something, we have a network of people that we're working with already on the same things elsewhere. So part of it is having that kind of ready to go network 
that says, okay, payroll providers, I can give you the lay of the land. Bank and credit, like maybe you're not bankable yet. Well, there's still options. We can give you the lay of the land. So kind of knowing how to navigate outside the company is as important as knowing what to do inside. That is a really, really good point. And thinking back to another personal experience, going back to 2020 and dealing with all the the PPP and EIDL, and even more recently, we bought our office building and going through the the process with the bank. I could not have done that on my own. I, I could have, but it would have been, it would have taken much longer. It would have been much uglier. There would have been so much more back and forth. And to be able to say, I'm not good at this. I don't enjoy doing this. Let me hand this off to somebody who does. And I know I'm going to get a better result. That was life-giving for me. And it helped us get to where we were trying to go faster. Yeah, definitely. You know, accounting and finance is no different than so many other functions in a startup, so many other functions in, in a founder's company. Ultimately, as you grow in scale, you need to find at what point am I delegating? How do I trust others to execute on my behalf? And I think growing a company, that's, you know, it's a difficult process. I think often it's one that, you know, in the accounting finance function, we're a trusted and critical element of the operations of a business. So I understand how sometimes that's a difficult thing to start to let go of. Often, I think it's not an open-ended rope, like you're not letting completely go of it. And so I think having someone help you, I think of it, you know, is not outsourced, but we're we're really a part of your business. You know, we're going to sit with you, meet with you every week, be a part of what's going on. It's not something you're handing over or outsourcing per se. If I'm a founder, I'm a couple years into my business. What do I need to be thinking about? What do I need to be looking for in, in the business that would make me go, you know what, I need to find a fractional accounting and finance firm? Yeah, so I would say if you look at your what you have today, you look at your growth plans, and probably if you're early on, you fit into this, some form of this category of having a bookkeeper. Maybe they're also your tax firm that's doing bookkeeping for you on the side. Maybe it's someone you know an admin or something like that. But at the point you realize, first, I need something more timely. That's usually one pain point is the speed. The second is kind of the sophistication. So you want to move from cash basis to accrual. You want to understand more than just the cash activity in the bank. And the point in which you realize, okay, maybe I need to forecast and understand what's happening in the business going forward, not just strictly backward. A lot of times those are the catalysts that kind of drive you to think like, I need more than a bookkeeper. Man, there's three or four things in there that I want to unpack. At the end, you you talked about forecasting, and this may tie back into a a question I'll come to in a minute. But for me, there's kind of a pride factor that, you know, there's certain things that I'm freely willing to admit that I'm not good at and that I don't want to do. But when it comes to something like a forecast, man, I don't know that I want to admit that somebody outside would know things better than I would about my own business and that that might be something that would hold me back from bringing somebody in as letting down my pride and saying, okay, no, I'm, I'm not as good at this as I think I am. Yeah. I mean, I think that's an element with so many things you'll have to delegate or accept others into, right? As they help you, you probably will know your business better than anyone, hopefully. And you will know if that forecast is on or off base Again, it's more of a collaborative effort. So don't think if you have, you know, a business that you feel like is complicated or if you feel like, well, it's going to be too inefficient for my time for me to teach someone else how to think about forecasting this Think along two lines. One, it's an investment. So maybe you're fine today. But if you double in size again, how will your time need to be spent? And it would probably be better to make that investment sooner rather than later at some point. You know, so you think trending things forward, how do I delegate what I need to, or at least get help or support around what I need? The forecasting element's not done in a silo. It's not done in a vacuum. It's really a partnership. So you might very well know all the plans you have to grow. You also might have some blind spots. Whereas you think about those plans in the future, someone else looking from the outside is going to say, well, wait, Scott, how's this going to work? 
if you're scaling delivery and yet we have some bottlenecks, you know, on onboarding or something. Uh, you know, there'll be you probably will be aware of those, but you might not be. Yeah, I can think of many of those kinds of conversations that people have have helped me think through. From personal experience, there are a couple of things that I look back on and go, gosh, I wish I had done this earlier. One, and I may have told this story before at some point, but I remember in January of probably the third or fourth year in the business, I am going online. I found some system to help me generate 1099s for contractors and, and other vendors and I'm going back through all the books and I'm having to total up, okay, how much did we, you know, okay, wait, can I get this out of the can? Now do I have to go back to the bank to figure out how much we paid? Eh. And I spent hours and hours and hours generating 1099s for contractors. And that was one of those, golly, there is much better and higher use of, of my time as the founder, as the visionary that's trying to move this business forward than generating 1099s. The other thing so we ran on QuickBooks for the first many years, and QuickBooks is great in a lot of ways. I mean, it makes things pretty darn simple. There's, there's a lot of limits to what it can do for you. But when you're first starting out, I mean, it's great. And it'll pull in all your banking transactions, and you can go in there and code them and, and tie them back to invoices if you need to and whatnot. But man, I would get in these patterns where I wouldn't pick it up. I wouldn't do it for weeks at a time. Then all of a sudden, I had this flood to, to try to do things before the end of the month. And I will also say, and I, I hate to admit this, I didn't know how to fully do a bank reconciliation and I didn't know how to actually close a month in the system. And I went for years without closing a month. And at some point, uh, another advisor of mine said, hey, Scott, let's walk through your PL and let's look at how you're doing month by month. And I'm like, kind of sheepishly giving him my financial reports. And he was like, you're, you're not closing your books, are you? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And so again, you know, another area that I, I wish that I had handed off sooner, kind of going back to something you said a minute ago, I think a lot of people look at accounting and finance as a, a necessary evil, a cost center. But when you're working with the right people, I think it can actually be something that is strategic and potentially the sort of thing that can help you generate more revenue and generate more profitability. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to when I, I make the comment, our people or our, our firm, we're more than just accountants. I think accounting is a necessary evil in a way, and someday it will be automated. So the fact of the matter is most accounting is the recording of the past. And so if that's all we're doing, you can find ways to do that faster, cheaper, more automated, which is helpful. The way I look at it and the way I, I want our team to look at it is that's context and that is involvement in a business where you're going to see a lot of things. And as you see those things, you can speak into areas of value. It's an input into a bigger function if the founder, the CEO, if the management team lets it. And that's part of maturing your business. So it's part of not controlling so much, but realizing your highest and best use as a, as a CEO. It's bringing people in to advise and be strategic with you. When you think of it, you get what you put into it. And what you need to put into it in a lot of cases is trust as a CEO to trust another team who might not be fully employed directly by you. You get out of it, this perspective, you get out of it, hopefully out of that team, you're having insight into the direction to move things in the future. I've had, and it doesn't happen overnight, right? Like that's a process you need as a CEO to understand. It might take a year for that team to really add all of the value that I'm talking about in that they've gotten to know your business, they've gotten to know your habits, they've gotten to know you as a CEO, the tendencies that you have, right? Because we're seeing the same thing in other places and every business is run by people. And all these people are are people, right? So there'll be things I'll see. They'll say, Scott, have you thought about this? Well, a lot of that might have to do with you as a leader versus someone else and what your organization seems like it needs or what the finance function needs given your growth plans or your business or your industry. So that stuff takes time. It also takes an audience. Like you as a CEO, 
need to be willing to realize that you could have help in that way. And I think probably not to your own fault because most accounting firms don't think that way. Most accounting firms are exactly what I said, you know, thinking, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of them are focus on coding the bank feed, you know, booking the transactions, reconciling the balance sheet. But the good ones, you know, ones who are partners of the business should be thinking like you, if I'm in your shoes, what are you going to need next? And that might not be anything to do with closing the books, right? It might have everything to do with how you're pricing your product. For somebody that's listening to this and saying, okay, light bulb, I need to go find somebody to take this off of my, my plate. What are the kinds of questions they should be asking? What are the kinds of things that they should be looking for when selecting a firm? Yeah, it's a good question. The first thing, you know, in how to find a firm, probably it's a trusted advisor. It's often a relational, call it sell. For us, we're getting almost always a referral from someone else who's already worked for us. We're getting a referral from a bank who's worked with us or a a VC or private equity firm who's worked with us. So how to find, reach out to your network and those around you, see what their experience has been, and kind of explore that from a, a relational standpoint for what their ups and downs have been with that firm. I would say when it comes to what to look for, I, I think first, the delivery model, because everyone's, you know, in the end, all these firms, they have a certain level of expertise. They have a staff, right? So what's their service offering? Are they a CPA firm? which is different than just fractional accounting and finance. Fractional accounting and finance generally is consulting. CPA firms are generally practicing public accounting. They're registered with the board, which means they're often doing tax, audit work, other things that might to you seem similar, but are going to spread them much thinner. They're going to split their time. And when I talk about the delivery model, what I mean is, okay, who am I going to work with? Who's my point person at your firm? Who's going to execute just the point person? Am I getting a single person? Am I getting a team? If I'm getting a team, tell me about who they are and where are they based? And is it all in the U.S. or is it also offshore? Where is it in in an offshore? And how do you guys work together? Do you work through an intermediary for that offshore, meaning someone else is marking up and then again, or are they your own people? These are all things I think as you investigate will drive some of the way that they deliver for you. And I think in the end, the question you're trying to answer for yourself is, how can I see this team being engaged in my business to enough degree that I'm getting more than just accounting out of it? Expanding on that, we began working with your firm, um, I guess, two years ago. And won't get into the the reasons why we transitioned from our, our previous provider, but there were a lot of hiccups with delivery and responsiveness and and so forth. And as we started looking for the new firm and glad we found y'all for us, there were several main areas that we needed help in and the bookkeeping was, was definitely one of them, but also even though we have a payroll system, somebody still has to go in and run the payroll and do the state tax filings and, and things like that. Then there's, you know, occasionally the the interactions with the bank and then there's the the strategic let's do the planning aspect of it. And then there is also the tax aspect. There's probably three or four other things that I'm, I'm not even thinking of. And so I think that when you are evaluating a firm, you've got to figure out which of these buckets do you need them to help you with? Is it all of them? Is it three out of five? Is it just one? And, and so anyway, I think that's another important thing to consider. Yeah, it, it's something to interview the firm about. So with one of them, you might say, well, hey, how do you improve accounts payable? What's your best practice for that? They might say, well, we go paperless. We want to automate with bill.com and have that integrate with your ledger. Like they may have a solution for most of those things. I think a lot of it, you know, will kind of depend on, do you have a fire or do you not have a fire? You know, because a lot of times, say 50% of the clients that come to us are reacting. It's reaction to the bank won't give me financing because I don't have good financials, or I can't tolerate not understanding as much about my business as I need to. I know the books are behind. I mean, we've had some clients come to us nine months behind, 12 months behind. Some come to us when the team walks out, they had an in-house person and they realized this isn't going to work when I had the second person walk out. Now I have to go to a recruiter 
and find another one and I have to wait and then I have to train them. A lot of that's a reaction to something that's happened. So I think as a business owner, hopefully the audience here can be proactive about it, not wait till there's that issue and have the time to interview and say, okay, with your firm, what are best practices that you see in my business that I would need to cover? And a lot of times we'll have a what's called a scoping call where we walk through the basics of what you have going on and look at your financials. You know, we can pretty much tell in an hour if you're in good shape or not in good shape, where the pain points are, where that added, you know, low-hanging fruit would be in the first, call it one, two months. As you say, you know, you think about what to ask them for help with. I think part of it is invite them to tell you what they can help with. Give them a, a full view of what's going on. Be open and transparent. And then ask them, what would you guys do for me in the first 90 days that would move the needle? You know, and they should have an answer. When you do get into these these conversations and, and you're positioning to set up an engagement, what are some of the common objections that you get from business owners about outsourcing? That's a good question. So inherently, you lose control a little bit, right? So to me, in what I see, the biggest hurdle is often that lack of physical presence in the office and the lack of the ability to kind of control what the person's doing. There's a trade-off between all of the benefits we've talked about and losing some element of control to be able to decide kind of everything, every aspect of what an employee would do for you if they were in-house. Something I know that I was personally a little bit nervous about was that giving up control, but not so much in the ways that you described, more okay, am I really comfortable with somebody else having access to my bank? And as we've gone through this, and y'all probably work with people a little bit differently from company to company, but you don't have unfettered access to the bank. And yeah, you can go in and view, you can pull statements, you can see the transactions, but you don't have the ability to just unfettered go transact on our bank. And I think that was something when I first started this that I had to get, that gave me a lot of comfort in ceding some of that control. Yeah, and that's part of maturing in your business, right? As your accounting and finance function matures, as your business grows, there are all kinds of things where ultimately, if you have 100 people in your organization or 1,000 people in your organization, you're not controlling any of that. You're not even looking at the bank account anymore. There's a point in which that control is based on a system. It's based on a process. For us in the beginning, like you, you talk about the first time you give access to an outside firm on the bank, any concern you have, we should explore. Okay, you think we're going to wire money out or something, we can put in controls, right? Like, so to your point, it isn't unfettered access. It doesn't, it should never be that, right? So you can question that of the firm and they should have good answers that say, okay, here's what we usually do, right? Here's the way it should usually work because ultimately that protects everyone. And likewise, I think there'll be other suggestions they make like, well, you should maybe have positive pay on your account if you're writing checks and things that are just other controls as a treasury function you should have in place. Something you just said, another light bulb moment, you talk about positive pay. I know what that is just because the industry that we work in, we come across it with some of our clients. But that's a term that I'm guessing there's probably plenty of founders, particularly in smaller organizations that don't even know what that is. And so describe it, but more importantly, these are the kinds of perspectives that you're going to get from an outside firm that you're not going to get if you're trying to do it yourself. Yep. I think it's a good example of you don't know what you don't know. And if you hire professionals, they're going to look at something totally differently that they do every day and say, you're crazy to do it that way, right? We've come across some clients who have a single bank account with a few million dollars in it. They're cutting checks off that bank account. They're taking deposits in, everything's, you know, just in one place and they're $20 million a year. And you, you kind of look at that and you're like, well, first, nothing's interest bearing, which in today's environment does matter. So we tell them about ICS and how to have things off balance sheet yet have yield. Second, they're not maybe taking advantage of being able to get as many electronic payments from their customers because they're nervous to get out their bank account number. Yet when they write checks, at the bottom of every check, their bank account number, right? So there's this element of, there's a kind of like a basic structure that they should have in place if they're going to grow. And at that point, you know, they have no idea what that is. They should take advice from someone like us because 
in the end, it's really not more costly. It's actually just a lot more functional and in the end, a lot more controlled. When is the right time for somebody to take this on? Is there a time in the life cycle of the business that this really makes a lot of sense? Is there a time of year that this makes sense? Yeah, that's a good question too. I think if you've realized pain points and are reacting to them, the time was already yesterday. So think about your business. What do you have in a growth plan right now? It's December. I don't know when this will get released, but in 2024, think about what do I have you know, in the next year, the next two years, then back up six months. Because as a fractional firm, you're not obligating to much, right? You're obligating to invite a partner in and understand about the business. You'll have a little bit of cost, but it's fractional. It's not full time. There's not a huge stair step in cost, but there is a benefit in acting in a proactive manner versus a reactive manner. So my point is earlier than you think would be an advice for those who have businesses on the earlier stage. For those who already have in-house team members and they're worried about like one team member is really, really critical. Like you had said originally in this, you're a firm believer in having that outside influence and help. We have a lot of clients where they have a full-time in-house controller and we are the second set of eyes. We are the, call it fractional CFO, as well as augmentation for helping that controller not get bogged down in too much of the minutia and the detail in the in the real transactional stuff. So even if you feel like, well, I'm I'm not at the stage, I, I need to outsource anything because I can afford full-time people, you might be surprised to hear half of our teams are already have full-time people and we're just helping them. We're augmenting them which gives them that flexibility. One thing we didn't talk about, the reason I started, you know, the reason I believe in fractional, one of them is why would you ever have a fixed full-time team for a business that has variable needs? Every business has variable needs. And those variable needs get impressed upon accounting the same way they do other functions. Why not have a flex resource to help even if you have full-time people? So, I think for those with, you know, that feel like they're further along, they're more mature. Hey, I already have a full-time CFO. I already have a controller. Well, those individuals might benefit from extra help as well. That's a great point. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for coming into the studio and being on In the Thick of It Toolbox. Yeah. Thanks for having me. That was Patrick Tam, CEO and Managing Director of Bright Balance. To learn more, visit brightbow.com. That's B-R-I-G-H-T-B-A-L.com. If you or a founder you know would like to be a guest on In the Thick of It, email us at intro at founderstory.us. 